each looked for an easier time and a result less fundamental and astounding. I love that sentence because the kids often, they think these words, they're not used to these words being used in such a powerful way. The a result less fundamental and astounding. Just changing the whole country. <clears throat> Keep going. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. <laughs> It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread in the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not, that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Okay, let's stop again. So he's making a transition here from, and from determining what the cause of the war was to um, to what? What's going on here? It's in God's hands. It's in God's hands. Where do you see that? Um, it's just a it's just a quote I'm getting from the actual mm -hmm. the old Bible quotes and everything else. It's just kind of like this is fate now. Mm -hmm. He's doing something more here with that way. The way he was using all before, he's using how is, do you see he's using that here as well? What words does he use here to bring people together? Um, neither. Neither, and also, what's the, does anybody see anything else? Both. Both, yep, both. Yeah. both. yep. Neither and both. He, he's bringing everybody, he's saying we're all, we may not be seeing this from the same perspective, but we're all seeing it together. And I kind of take that, that both sides here have, have lost. Neither side is you know, jumping for joy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and he really is bringing everybody together. But let's talk about that dig for a second. What, what's his dig here? <clears throat> the prayers of both could not be answered. The prayers of both could not be answered. Um, um, that of neither has been answered fully. They could, yep, they, we can't, we can't, we're not gonna be satisfied. What's he, what, I mean, he, what, he, he's, his previous <coughs> sentence though, it may seem strange. Yeah. What's going on in that sentence? Anybody want to read it aloud again? Somebody, just go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, it may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of, another, of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we be not judged. Is that a dig against slavery? Yeah. yeah. What, what's he, what's he, how, how do you take that? that? They're making money from cool. someone else's work. Yeah. yeah. But who do you think he's talking to there? I think it really oh, south. Is that you think he's talking? Okay, well, tell I me, mean, say more. Slave about owners. That. Mm -hmm. Slave owners. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and and the workforce. Um, think about the northerner here for a second. Why might that sentence? And I'm just thinking of this right now, so don't think I'm so far ahead of you here. <laughs> Why might that sentence be addressed to a northern audience? I think he's, he's, he's critical of the fact that the Northerners really um, didn't maybe speak up more loudly against him, mm -hmm. maybe that they even have labor issues themselves. Remember he quotes the Bible here, though. He says it may seem strange mm -hmm. that slavery exists, but he's quoting the Bible here, let us judge not that we be not judged. So yeah, he's, he's bringing up issues of labor in the North. And he's saying, hey, you Northerners, you abolitionists, you may think those Southerners are pieces of white trash, but let us judge not that we be not judged. You're not God. It's interesting because he's got m many, many audiences here. And we're going to be playing with that in a minute. I was thinking similar to the reference of uh, what he used, cast the first stone, be without sin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it seems like another biblical ref a reference to that yeah. part of the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. Let's keep going. Let's go to that quote. Whoa. <clears throat> My apologies for cutting you off. It's okay. <laughs> Wo woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must be needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man for whom the offense cometh. What does this mean? What does this biblical this quote mean? Let's let's break it down because it's not an easy one. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it, 
for it must be that offenses, but it, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. I mean, to go back to the biblical language, mm -hmm. he said, I, I think he's, he's saying something along the line of, um, it's a shame that we have to live in a world of sin. This is a sinful world, so we should right. feel sorry for ourselves. And this is a workplace where sin is going to happen. But God help the sucker that commits the sin. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, like yeah. Bad things happen. Right. This could have been. Right. Well, and also, like, you better not be the one who's actually doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And what's what he's doing is it almost looks here like he's setting up the South, but then let's see what comes next. You wonder if there's a little confusion in the speech because hmm. he starts out saying it's about saving the Union, mm -hmm. and then he ends up saying, "Well, this is really about the retribution for slavery." Which is it? It's the big question of the Civil War, isn't it? <laughs> It seems strikes me, realistically, he can't have it both ways, mm -hmm. even though he wants it that way. Um, could you read it though as more of a superficial understanding? So superficial that you is my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean the, the whole thing about preserving the union that, you know, that's sort of, you know, the reading of it initially, but then. You know, I mean, we spent the whole week studying Lincoln and how he, you know, agonized over this stuff and his summer retreat and this and that. That at a deeper level, you know, he's looking for a more meaningful way to frame the whole thing so that it's not necessarily contradictory, but just deeper readings of the same situation. Um, I would throw out to you also that Abraham Lincoln was the consummate politician. He was a great politician. He was a great leader. That's separate from his having been a great politician. And that he was very conscious of the laws of the land in the way that he handled this war in the first half of the war. And in the second half, he started to become much, um, he was looking for a deeper meaning for himself, both with the death of his son and with the death of all of these soldiers who, whom he was mourning. Um, and he really started drawing on looking for looking for a deeper meaning in a different way. Well, so I so I that doesn't answer your question. Please. Back in the 19th century, I, didn't most Americans, or at least you know, the elites believe that democracy was uh, a divine uh, act? I, I mean. It, Reagan wasn't the first person to say that the United States is a city on the hill. I mean, you got mm -hmm. Melville and all these other guys yeah. referring to it that way. So for Abraham Lincoln, couldn't that also be the case? That to preserve the union was to keep God's purposes, God's will going on earth, because as long as democracy was there, justice could be done. That's really interesting. Yeah, and that was, it was Winthrop, it was that early on, you know, yeah. the city on the hill. Started. Remember that yesterday talking about how the Declaration of Independence was the apple, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and the Constitution is yeah. the frame. Mm -hmm. Goes right back to that. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. I mean, this is what brings the whole thing full circle from the introduction to what Mike said about you know, he started out trying to preserve the union, and yes, slavery was a major part of it, but I think, you know, but that's changed people. You'll have, an, you'll have a belief when you're a younger person, and then as you get older, and this experience starts to mold and shape you, you start to, especially having a child or something else, it makes you think differently. And this war with the loss of his own child and the loss of all of these mother's children changed him. So we need to get back to a place that brings us back together. Mm -hmm. I see also that he's using this whole biblical 
kind of exegesis almost to set up what he says in the last paragraph. Mm -hmm. Because if none of us are responsible, then we have to move forward. We have to strive on with malice toward none and charity for all. We can't hold it against anyone. Especially when he said back in a couple of sentences before that both sides have committed sins during the course of this war. Yeah, does he really say that nobody's responsible, or does he say that we're all? I, I, I sort of get the sense he's saying that we're all responsible. Right. Yes, definitely. Yes, yes, I yeah. agree yeah. with you. I totally agree with you. We are all responsible. But he, he still names the insurgents. Yes. So he's still pointing yes. the finger somewhere. Yeah. I, I still wonder to what degree does Lincoln himself take personal responsibility for, you know, all these tremendous loss. I mean, in the first inaugural, a lot of your memory, he said, I've taken an oath to preserve the Union. So I'm this passive agent, essentially, and I must follow my oath. But of course, he didn't have to follow his oath exactly as he saw it. He, he had passive. other choices. You know, what do you think? I think, and he wasn't passive. He, you know, he used the Constitution to his benefit, and at other times he expanded powers in it and stretched things and kind of toyed with it in order to achieve a goal. When you're saying he's a master politician, it wasn't just, it wasn't, in my opinion, this, I'm a moral person that's just following my oath. Mm -hmm. He was very deliberate in what he did. He was very calculated in what he did. And the way things that he followed in the Constitution, things that he chose to kind of stretch a little bit, it was all for his kind of for this goal to win the war. Very Machiavellian. Yeah. And just yeah. By One of the um, phrases that I, I find really powerful from, I, I don't know if you, if you all are ever trying to make these connections. I can't imagine you're not. But I, I'm always looking for those threads that go through sort of the 19th century or, or follow from the Declaration, you know, the different political threads through to um, the Civil War and beyond. And Lincoln was a great, uh, follower of Daniel Webster, and um, the, who, you know, the Whig politician, and one of Webster's phrases, or his 